Hi. Hey. hey guys, how are you? Great, thanks. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. I just want to introduce you quickly. This is Madeline, Madeline Shelby. Hi. Uh, she's my partner for the events team. Awesome. Yeah, so how's your week been so far? Good. I'm still in quarantine post-bubble, so a little yeah. quiet, but that's okay. <laughs> Honestly, it's nice to have some time to chill out. How about you guys? Pretty good. School's uh, super busy for me, definitely, but, you know, I love being busy, so it's okay for me. <laughs> you guys are all online, right? Yeah. yeah. This whole yeah. online thing, it's still taking me a little bit to get used to, but it's keeping uh, me it's nice. At least you're in school still doing something. That's honestly helpful, I think. Keeps everybody distracted. Yeah, definitely. It gives us something to do with the uh, lack of activities we can do right now. So. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have um, some questions lined up for you, but feel free yeah. to ask us any questions throughout at any time. Okay, sounds so, good. So first off, I, I saw that you're a graduate from Xavier University with a bachelor's in finance, correct? You got okay. it. So I remember you explaining this at the symposium I mentioned uh, in our emails in January, but do you mind just recapping for everybody on how you started up in Toronto and moved from sales and finance to sport? Yep, definitely. Hold on one quick second. One of our players is texting, so I just want to – so he'll leave me alone just a sec. Um, so, yeah, so I um, – Went to Santa Fe, you said I'm from Halifax, originally from out east. Um, I took a uh, major in fine. I wanted to take business. Business was always something I was super passionate about. Um, still am. I still, you know, I'm an entrepreneur on the side, and I work with a lot of our players on a lot of business stuff as is. So it's definitely something I still get to do quite often. Um, for me, choosing a major in finance was, like, more so um, – practicality I thought that would be like a harder skill to like learn in the workforce um so that's kind of why I decided to major in it I definitely once I was in it I was like yeah I'm definitely not going to do this full time <laughs> I wasn't super interested in it um but it, I did learn a lot of things and it was a it was a really you know a lot of practical skills that came out of that um ultimately like as I started to get towards the end of my undergrad I started thinking about like what type of business that I want to do and I think like going to a small school out east like probably and I graduated ooh, almost 10 years ago now which is crazy but um there definitely wasn't as much um uh, resources especially out east around like sport programming and things of that nature and so it was kind of on me to like figure out on my own a lot of the people that I went to school with and ultimately ended up working in sort of like more traditional business environments like you know, larger corporations, accounting firms, consulting firms, um, things of that nature, banks, um, and that wasn't something I was super interested in. So it was sort of on me to sort of figure out what I was interested in. And, you know, I played basketball growing up. Basketball was a, was a huge part of my life and kind of a huge part of my identity. So sports was sort of like the first place that I felt like I could really like combine two passions and then music was like the other one that I was sort of looking at as well around the same time like those were sort of the two industries I started to target um and that just came from like what did I like so the business part was still really big for me but you know business is so general so that's kind of where I zeroed in on like what did I really want to do and that just came from like the things that I like doing you know play basketball growing up always sort of like living in sports cultures and sports spaces. And then also I used to work in radio. We did a lot of concerts, a lot of music stuff. And so those were kind of the two areas that interest me the most. And ultimately like how I, how I decided, you know, which direction to go. So everybody's like, it kind of says the same thing like, Oh, you kind of like switch it up. And I'm like, ah, I never really had like into finance intentions in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I can admit I probably wouldn't see myself in finance, <laughs> but what I do appreciate about the sport management program is that we still have the business background incorporated yeah, in that. Exactly. So we got a little bit of both sport and business, so that is yeah, something that I really like. Those, I mean, I think there was maybe a couple programs like that that existed when I was going to university. Most of them are kin-focused programs um, as opposed to, like, business programs. The business ones sort of came later, so I definitely – like would have taken one of those, I think, if it had been available. I think there were some in Ontario, but, you know, I was kind of like, I was, you know, playing basketball at the time too, so I was making my school decision off of different, um, d a different set of requirements. But, you know, when I moved to Toronto, when 
I wasn't sure if I was going to get a job in sports or not right away. My, my intention was to go to George Brown if I didn't get a job in sports mm-hmm. to kind of like take that program, build connection, do the internship. Like that was definitely my, my planned route. If, if I hadn't gotten a job in, in sports, the, the job that I ended up getting. Yeah, I was actually talking with a professor and they said that sport management has been around for maybe like 20 years, but hasn't been popular or um, yeah. been like, I don't even know, just, just not in today's, it was just so minimal. And then even four years ago when I was like, when I was in high school, I learned about this one program, but I was like, no, like, I don't know about that. And then it's really just been on the come up. Yeah, so, now there's, like, these programs are some of, like, the best in the country. Like, you know, they have a, now they're super competitive to get into. The only reason I knew um, about the Brock one is because one of my, like, high school teammates, she ended up playing basketball at Brock, and she, I think she took the kin version of it. So, like, I had a little bit of exposure to it from that. But other than that, like, that was just, like, <laughs> back when I was, like, your majors were, like, marketing, finance, accounting, and then there was, like, some leadership studies one that was, like, nobody really even knew what that meant at the time like there's very like traditional majors you know yeah oh yeah there's like right now there's so much out there and honestly I hadn't even heard about the sport management program until honestly I was like in grade 12 applying to universities so so crazy right you like you don't you know you're not really not say you're not educated but they you know traditional education still very much like funds itself right so a lot of times like this, the the courses that you take in high school are, like, ultimately what they're trying to funnel you into. So you're like, okay, I have to, like, science, um, English, language, history, business. Like, they're, it's very, like, cut and dry, you know? Yeah. And until you, like, seek out that information yourself, it often, it often like, kind of limits your thinking a little bit because that's all you're exposed to. Yeah, there's absolutely so much more out there. It's um. crazy. So we did want to say congratulations on your new position as the Director of Basketball Advancement. Thank you. So could you tell us a little bit about what this role entails? Yeah, so um, the role is sort of like an evolution of the role that I already had. Um, Ultimately, um, we've had a lot of success over the last few years of um, our player development programs and, like, you know, our ability to – to put systems and procedures and processes and people in place to support players in their development journeys, whether that be as basketball players, as, you know, their physical being through their, you know, through their medical performance, um, and also just as human beings and their personal lives, whether that be um, with their families, as fathers, as sons, as brothers, as businessmen, um, as community leaders. And so this is sort of like the next iteration of how do we um, – how do we build that culture across our entire organization and how do we think a lot more strategically about it? Um, it's sort of my job to like bridge the gap between all the departments that contribute to the development of our players and also our staff. Um, and how do we make sure that we're always seeing the bigger picture and that we're always all on the same page? Cause what gets really difficult is like through the course of a day a player sees like 10 different people. And so if those 10 people have, are not talking and don't have the forums to share information and the structure to support it. Like those 10 people could all be talking about different things, could all be on different pages of what they think that, um, that that player needs to get better at, or there could be things happening in one area that people in the other area don't know about. And so it's really important as we like, um, as we, promote sort of like the holistic human being versus just like the athlete and their on-court performance like how do we make sure that everybody's on the same page with how you support them as humans so um that's sort of like a big part of my role and then part of it is also like bridging that gap between um our players and like our front office so because I work with our players so much I help through the draft process and onboarding new players and kind of like using what I know about our guys and the guys that I've had through our system to kind of um, take that knowledge and apply it to new players as they come in, as we see where they need support and, and, you know, where we can resource them to help them grow. So yeah, it's a different thing. (laughs) It's exciting. Yeah, no, I I really like that. Um, Just in broad terms, I like that it's management and then also caring for your athletes. Um, Yeah. It's super important, right? Like, yeah, they're not just athletes, they're human beings. And like you said, they, 
they carry immense um, weight and immense platform and all of our guys are, are really incredible at using that platform. And so how do we make sure they have resources to grow in those spaces too? Like it's not just about them becoming better basketball players. Like we have to, you know, mm -hmm. and most of them for the most part, like want to become better people. They want to, and not even better people, but want to just grow in different areas of their life. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's just, yeah. that's just a part of life. And so we're sort of the system, um, we're the system that they're in. So it's up to us to kind of support that growth. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so important. And uh, like you were saying, that communication through different people, like you're, if you're saying, you know, they're seeing 10 people, you know, is it all connected? Are they all giving the yeah. same kind of information? Yeah, that's so key. And it seems so simple, but it's hard because it's like everybody's so busy and this industry moves at such a high pace that like stopping to talk with each other is just like it doesn't happen naturally. Like it requires a structure, it requires a, like a deliberateness to it that it doesn't just pop up during the day, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really do appreciate you saying that because I'm, I've been totally adamant about showing that athletes are more than athletes athletes are more than statistics and salaries and they're mm -hmm. people and yeah they're surrounded by sport 24 7 but yeah. just like you said they want to grow in other ways too right of course so, and honestly like they're super impressive and impactful in a lot of other ways like mm -hmm. some players are like some players greatest accomplishments don't come from basketball you know what i mean like the things that they're ultimately most proud of may not be basketball Mm -hmm. exactly and uh, just to touch upon communication like it's so true even thinking about just one component if the medical staff is not in clear communication with the coaches it could be very detrimental to the um to the player so yeah, if you have 10, 10 people <laughs> you definitely need some sort of structure definitely. in order That's to manage <laughs> yeah definitely. it's super important um so to go a little bit more in depth, uh, watching the Sportnet video that was posted, I believe, at the end of August, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, um, I really appreciated your comment about how diversity is a competitive advantage. I absolutely mm -hmm. love that, and I kind of took that as my own understanding. But do you mind elaborating on how you believe this is to be a competitive advantage in the workplace or even just overall? Yeah, I think, you know, the really, like, I'd say like sad and depressing place that we've arrived to is that everything requires like a business case at this point to change. So we know in corporate structure and political structure and law enforcement structure, there's, there's sort of like all of these systems in place to benefit a certain group of people. And in order to, you know, generate change and convince the people to hold the power to, to value change, you do have to have some type of business case. And again, it's not, I don't support that thinking. I, you know, I, do, I don't support diversity as a business case because I think it has so many more implications that go well beyond the benefits of what it can mean from a business standpoint. But for the people who really only care about one thing and one thing is like making money or winning or whatever the case may be, like for those types of people who are sort of tunnel vision, it's like really important for people to understand, you know, how important it is to have a diverse group of voices like leading you and leading your decision making and contributing to your to your strategies and and to the to the moves that you ultimately end up making because you know we live in like this world where you're able to sort of like because of like the internet and because of um, technology like we're able to sort of like curate everything that we see you know what I mean like mm -hmm. you know. 40 years ago, you had 10 channels you could watch. And that's what right now I can, my entire Twitter and Instagram feed, what I choose to watch on television, the articles I choose to read, um, I can build that. So all of those things are just reaffirming my biases, reaffirming my opinions, my views, my values. Like there's nothing that challenges you like you can literally build a world where all you see is things that you agree with and I think disagreement is healthy I think challenging each other is healthy and I think the only way that you can achieve that type of um I'd say like healthy discussion and healthy um challenging of people and of ideals and values and methods and strategies and procedures 
only happens when you have a diverse group of people in the room because now you have people who have come from every walk of life, who have lived multiple different types of experiences, who have experienced different prejudice and racism and, um, and barriers in their life. And ultimately, to me, that type of diverse experience can push you well beyond what you would just think if you were thinking of it by yourself or you were sitting in a room with a bunch of people who lived the exact experience of you. You're not going to come up with anything new. And so to me, innovation is how you win. Innovation is how you grow. Innovation is how you, you know, you run successful business. And I don't think you can be super innovative when everybody looks the same, when everybody's lived the same life, when everybody's lived the same experiences. And so You know, from my perspective, that's sort of like where that stems from. And then on top of the business case for diversity, it's also just like a much better world to live in. Like it's a much more beautiful world. It's it's just like what you want. You know what I mean? It's like a type of environment that people want to be in as opposed to, you know, other potentially like oppressive or um, like singular environments. And so for me, that's sort of always been – my view on it you know Mm -hmm. yeah I love how you touched on you know pushing your boundaries you know exploring and just to have that growth mindset because I do agree with you you know learning from other people's experiences everyone has different experiences from Mm -hmm. all the walks of life and I think it really as a person can help you as an individual but you know in an organization just having that diversity and having those different experiences is really beneficial yeah Yeah, definitely. Like, you can live in a bubble. Like, you know, if you really don't seek out differing opinions, if you don't seek out other people's point of views, if you don't seek out, like, listening and hearing about other people's experience, like, you can live in, like, a really isolated bubble. Like, I read, like, really right-wing things kind of often, whether it be on Twitter or different articles, and it doesn't mean it changes my frame of reference or changes what I believe in. It doesn't. But it's really important that you, like, learn about different – and that you just, like, challenge – constantly challenge your own opinions by reading things that are the complete opposite of what you think and believe. And, again, that doesn't mean that it changes you. Maybe one – there's there's one piece you take from it. doesn't mean, you know, that you believe the things that they believe, but, like, constantly pushing yourself to challenge your own opinions, challenge your own views, challenge your own values – You have to, like, actively seek that out these days, you know? Yeah, I definitely – I agree with that. I love everything that you said. And it's true. Everyone has their own experiences, but that's when all different perspectives, ideas, and thoughts come into play. And imagine what you guys can come up with. Instead of being, one like, one-minded, you can have an open mind and collectively grow. Mm -hmm. Um, And – communication is so key and it's just it's how you go about these differences are you going to be more confrontational or take these differences and come together yeah is how I look at it I mean you can be one-sided okay be one-sided but that's not going to help anything no you know, if you want to grow it just can't be and it's I agree always educating yourself that doesn't mean your opinion has to change and, and maybe it does maybe it opens yeah, out of your mind that you yeah. didn't think about right so I oh. truly believe that education is one of the key pillars to taking action and growing and, you know, moving forward. So I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Constant education, constant growth. It's, it's so important. Yeah. But yeah. So another question relating to that specific video, um, Masai Ujiri made a wonderful comment about your qualities and specifically talked about how you bring guidance to the players, coaches, and the organization as a whole. So to be more specific, what guidance do you bring that ensures that every person in the Raptors organization is valued and included? Yeah, I think for me, um, player development is like a really unique area, um, isn't really attached to much, if that makes sense. So we have great relationships with the coaches, with the medical staff, with, um, with the front office, but because we're sort of in the middle of everybody, it gives us the ability to like see a bit of a bigger picture. So, you know, the coaches, it's sort of like, what is everybody focused on? The coaches are focused on winning games. Like every game is a challenge for them to win. The front office is more focused on like, yes, winning championships are more of like a longer-term view of the team. It's their responsibility to think about the team 
three, five years down the line? And what does the decisions that we make today, how does that affect us in three years and four years or next year? And then the medical staff, they're obviously, you know, focused on the physical being of the player and how do we make sure that there's both their short and long-term health um, from a physical standpoint is, um, is good and, you know, that they can have not only a long career, but a, a long, healthy life, you know, that's important too. And so sometimes those priorities can conflict and not in a negative way. It's just, you know, it's just the nature of the business. And so I think what I'm always kind of able to do is I spend a lot of time with everybody. So I have a lot of perspective from, I have different perspectives. And I think what I, what I ultimately do is I am able to like bring people together and, and, and find the middle common ground, you know? And I think, um, I try to like see everybody's side and, and then I try to guide whether it be our players or whoever it may be, um, into making decisions or, you know, um, doing things that are going to be just better for the organization and themselves from a long-term perspective. And so there's lots of things that you could do right now, but like, how does that help you in the long term? And so, you know, not having, our organization is really good about being patient. Um, you know, there's a lot about what I do that's kind of gray area. It's really hard to measure. It's really hard to like quantify. And if you have an organization that's putting pressure and not allowing you time to like build those relationships and like put the time in that it takes to develop these types of things and that type of rapport, uh, it can be really, really difficult to do this type of job. But luckily, you know, we're in a space where we value that type of position and I'm sort of like left to do it on my own and to do it in the way that I see fit. And so ultimately what that, what that kind of brings is like, I'm able to kind of bring people together and, you know, to, for the benefit of everybody's growth and development. And so, you know, I always, I kind of enjoy that part. Like I like people, I like to get to know people and I like learning about people. And so when you do that with everybody, it just gives you different perspective. And so, and if something that happens, whether it be good or bad, like you have a whole backstory behind it. You really know like what it is at its core and it just makes it easier for me to, to see other people's perspectives, I think. Yeah, I really appreciate that comment. You know, truly caring for your organization and everybody, every single person that's a part of it is so key mm -hmm. to make sure that they feel valued because maybe they don't have the same position as you or the same responsibilities, but what they do still matters. And yeah. I really appreciate your uh, mental health comment because I feel like sometimes that can be neglected or overlooked rather. And for instance, like being in the bubble, some some athletes broadcasted that, you know what, it's not the easiest time. Yeah, okay, they're still yeah. in the playoffs and they're excited, but they're also isolated from their families, the outside yeah. world. And if they're not taken care of or even the social injustice is happening, if the coaches don't come together and talk with their players to make sure they're okay, that can affect them in the long run, you For know? Sure. So it's and really like, important. All things can be true. You can not love the bubble but still want to win a championship. You can, you know, like there's – there's no like cut and dry answer, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, to anything. And so, you know, I think, and the other big part about this that like, I think we don't talk about enough is like, we spend more time with these people than we do our own families. I spend more time with the players and with my colleagues than I do with my boyfriend, with my mom, with my dad. Like, so it's really important that in that type of environment, we travel a lot, we're together a lot. Like, what type of environment would that be if you don't care about people or you don't care to like learn about who they are outside of working for the Raptors? You know what I mean? Like that would be a pretty like miserable existence. Yeah. You're on the road hundreds of days a year sitting on the plane next to someone and you have no, like you don't know them like that's yeah. terrible or, you know, going to dinner with them or in the trenches with them every day. Like that's not to me. It's, it's, First of all, it's not a pleasant or happy experience, but it's also just not a way to win. Like, you have to care mm -hmm. about the people that you're going to war with every single day mm -hmm. in order to, like, get the best out of each other and be able to push each other. It takes a level of trust, you know, to win championships. It takes a level of trust to be successful organizations. And, like, you don't build that trust. Like, what do you have, you know? Yeah. You can't just have that professional connection. You do need that personal connection, especially when you're saying – you know, you're spending more time with these people than your own family. Like, yeah. you know them like a family. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And that, like, makes it fun, you know, makes it better. 
yeah, just being on a plane and not being able to talk about anything and just sit in silence would not be fun out of how many games you have to travel. Like, yeah. Surface level, like things like that's or or just talk about basketball all the time like sometimes you need a break yeah you just want a little a little bit of a break let's talk about something else 100 <laughs> percent you gotta sometimes um, decompress a little bit yeah exactly so to look more into the toronto raptors this organization has been doing such an amazing job diversifying the workplace and all in all trying to change the surprise reaction when a woman is hired in the front office or any sport position Mm -hmm. So currently the sport world is still very male dominated Mm -hmm. and being a woman in sport, have you ever experienced any feelings of exclusion or have you been treated in a demeaning way, whether that may be in personal settings or the workplace? Mm -hmm. You know, I think honestly, we're, we're really lucky at the Raptors. I've not had any experiences like that in the, within our organization. I think the biggest change I think that we're working towards is like there's just like years and years of it being male dominated and habits are formed um systems are formed strategies are formed that all cater to men and it, it's I don't know if it was like exclusionary in nature when they made those decisions but they're like catering to the majority like that's who works in the NBA and so that's ultimately how the decisions are made um and so it's really just like being patient as we kind of like work through the unraveling of all that like the NBA has changed now and like now we need to change a bunch of things with it. Like the amount of NBA arenas that don't have a women's locker room near the team's locker room. And so you're running our, like one of our female assistant coaches is running to the other side of the building for her to be able to shower and change like before a game. Like there are things like that, that, you know, I don't think we're, we're done in a malicious or exclusionary way, but it's just things that we need to unravel in order to make this experience in this league more welcoming and and more inclusive and so you know I think we're getting there and we're definitely not all the way there we've got work to do and I think a lot of the other leagues have even more work to do um but it's if these things were just going to change on their own they would have changed by now like it's really it's it's up to us to be really deliberate in in seeking out that type of change and I think Mm -hmm. you know it doesn't hurt when like the most diverse front office or most diverse organization in the NBA wins a championship. Like now everybody's looking around thinking like, okay, wait, what are they doing different over there that we can do? And I, that's one of the reasons I believe. And that's not just mm-hmm. the, from a di- gender standpoint, that's like diversity and a whole bunch of other ways too, that I think, um, that I think yeah. make a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, things are changing at a very slow pace so (laughs) we're Mm -hmm. hoping that as future comes especially with organization we're trying to make a change just where we can have a foundation and start from there um so i'm hoping in the future things will things will change a little bit more um but having organizations such as the toronto raptors is really is a really good place to start and look at Mm -hmm. and kind of kind of reflect okay like so what is our organization doing what can we do to improve so yep yeah, absolutely. We have things that we can improve too, and we're we got to do that work too, right? It's exactly. never it's not like a check a box. Now you're mm-hmm. done, like you yeah. know, it's, it's constantly like, changing. It's like constantly constant changing. commitment. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so Brooklyn and I have been supporting you and your successes for uh, for long from afar, but <laughs> with all your experiences from taking. Um, a chance to move to a new city and progress mm-hmm. tremendously within the workplace, along with uh, running your own business as well. Um, what advice would you give to women such as myself in Brooklyn who have so many aspirations that will soon be out in the world and hopefully working in sport? Mm-hmm. Um, I think probably the two best pieces of advice that I've like been given in a multitude of different ways. And I guess I'd synthesize it down to this. The first one is like no one to put your blinders on. And that may seem like counterintuitive, but there's going to be a lot of things along the way that can distract you or bother you, upset you, or you may be looking towards a a job or industry or, or a space that doesn't have a lot of women or, you know, you don't see people who look like you in the positions that you want and you sort of 
have to put your blinders on and like not be bothered by those things. And so that would be like the first piece of information is like know when to just like put them on and be like, no, nope, I'm just going to ignore that. Like I'm just going to keep going, keep going, you know? So that tunnel vision, I would say like selective tunnel vision can be really, really valuable. Um, and then the other, the other um, piece of advice and like this one's pretty personal to me, but could apply I think to a lot of different people is just like the ability to let it go. And I think I said that in the sports interview, like I'm an overthinker by nature and it makes me really good at what I do. And it makes me really great at a lot of things because I'm constant, my mind's constantly going and I don't miss much, you know, like my ability to like think through every scenario and be prepared is really, really good. But you know, that can also have its, um, it's disadvantages too. I overthink a lot. You know, I question myself constantly. Um, and so knowing and like learning when to like let that go, like when it's productive and when it's not productive and like letting that go and when it's not productive is really important. I love that. I, I am definitely an overthinker myself and <laughs> do question hey, some things. That I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, Touching on the trusting aspect, we we were discussing how we want to be trustworthy in our organizations and for you with the athletes, but we also need to trust in ourselves that mm-hmm. we're making right decisions that, you know, be just be confident in, in what yeah. we're doing because maybe we'll make mistakes, maybe we won't, but mistakes can help us grow depending on how you react to those totally. mistakes. Totally, totally. There's like, nobody's perfect. Like everybody mm-hmm. makes mistakes. But for some reason, like when we make a mistake, we feel like it's like the end of the world. Yeah. And, like to literally anybody else, but it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, you know? exactly. I feel yeah. when someone makes a mistake, like ninety nine percent of those mistakes don't bother you. You're like, oh, they made a mistake, not a big deal. Like maybe there's that one percent of like things that are a really big deal or mm-hmm. whatever. But like ninety nine percent of the time, of someone in your life making a mistake, it's like cool, it's a mistake, and then you've forgotten about it a day later. But we like torture ourselves. Yeah. Like, like it's exactly. Yeah. I am one of those people. Yes. No, <laughs> so I'll no take mind. that in life. Like, wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, why did I say that? And then you're like, what? Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad I'm not alone, but I mean, yeah, recognizing exactly. that is the first step. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, but we could ask so many more questions, but we don't want to take up too much of your time. So okay. before I end it, what, um, do you have any questions for us at all? Maybe you guys could tell me a little bit more about like what you guys are building and, and kind of where you're, we're hoping to see it go. Yeah. So Madeline, do you want to go or? Yeah. So, um, I can actually read to you, uh, Shima's mission statement. So yeah, that'd be great. Shima works to celebrate, unite and advocate on behalf of people from all walks of life. Um, Shima will educate and lead on social and structural change that will foster an inclusive and empowering community in the Brock University Sport Management Program. So we're really just trying to change the culture surrounding the lack of inclusion of women and diverse social groups in the sport industry. So we, of course, want to expand further and create change all over, but we did need this foundation to start, which is why we're just starting with the students and faculty at our university, you know, hoping that by starting here, we can expand into, you know, when our peers uh, head out into the industry. That's really cool. Honestly, I've done I've done a lot of Brock events, like quite a few, mm-hmm. and it's always mostly guys. Mm-hmm. to be completely honest like it's like the room is always 80 to 90 percent and so yeah. I think this is like well needed and I think it's really really awesome that you guys are taking this on and ultimately I think like from an outreach perspective too like making sure that more women even know about the pro- like high school yeah. girls know about the program and are you know and are applying for it and, you know I think that's a huge huge huge, huge thing yeah and exactly. just what you said sorry Brooklyn <laughs> just touching no, on what you said about uh, you doing many of the uh, like events at Brock University and it mostly being male. I was at the event that uh, where you were the keynote speaker. Mm-hmm. And it was just so great to see that, you know, wow, a woman is doing this and a very successful woman, might I add. But it's true. You know, I did feel a little bit intimidated being surrounded by, you know, all these guys in the room with their suits. And but so absolutely, I do think, you know, this does need to be addressed. I've connected mm-hmm. with like a lot of the girls from the Brock program, like over the, cause I've spoken at it a few times and I've, cause like there's usually so few in the room. So like for me, it's like, 
the guys are cool. I'm happy to answer any questions, but like my priority as far as like who I respond to afterwards, because like you can get a lot of messages and like yeah. it's sometimes just not feasible to answer everybody. And as much as I would love to answer everybody, it's just not feasible. And so like I always am very deliberate about like I answer like any female from those events because like you said, there's not many. And so like they have 10 other male speakers that they can hit up. And so it's really important that like as women, we, we continue to like make I don't want to call it mentorship because I think that's like probably not, it's not really about mentorship, but like make sure that like women to women connections are strong and that we're like looking out for each other and, and deliberately connecting and deliberately building those relationships because ultimately like that's just important and they'll serve you for years. And that's honestly what if we're talking about like the patriarchy and like male dominated industry, that's what they've been doing for other men for years. Like that's why they're so, you know what I mean? Like that's part of the system that they've built. And so it's really important that we build our own system um, Mm -hmm. that serves us. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And that's what we're trying to do. We're really just trying to stay and be at the forefront of our, of the sport management program as a place for all students to feel welcome and included. um, Because we even had, we've had, people drop out of the sport management program because it's so male dominated. They felt like they didn't belong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it, and I, it's unfortunate that's never touched upon the marketing for this program. Who, what are the targets? You know, that's, that's the key thing. Um, Mm -hmm. And you're right. All the women should come together because we're, we're so spread out there. I'll have a seminar with 20 people. I'm the only girl. Maybe, maybe by chance. One other girl in the other class. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So it, I agree, like all of us coming together and, and we're really trying to emphasize that. And we are starting with Brock Sport Management Program. We are hoping awesome. to expand and also just bringing attention to the social injustice happening in the world, you know, just coming together. And that's when our diversity and inclusion comes into play. Um, so we're, uh, right. we have a lot program, of goals. Like, you know, obviously getting more women in this program is important, but also getting more people of color, more black people in the program is important. Exactly be between all between the three of us like not only is the program very heavily male it's also very heavily white and that's a problem in itself you know and so this type of like representation and like accountability to these types of programs because it's actually a really great place to start because there's only a certain number of people to get led into this program and if you can get your school to commit Mm -hmm. to targets like you can hold them accountable to those things and that's really really important there's so many, so many things in this world that like feels like so big at like, especially in the climate that we're in. Like you think about like what happened with Brianna Taylor and like yesterday, just like, I've been thinking all day, like, what can I do? Like, I can't vote in the U.S. election. So it's like, it seems like such a, so insurmountable sometimes. And so like really like looking inward and looking at your immediate circle of influence like where can I impact in the circles that I'm in right now if everybody does that that's how like societal progress gets made like we all have to like look at our own little environments and our own little bubbles and think like how can I impact this if everybody does that we can start it's a start but yeah I think that, like exactly have been around for hundreds of years for a reason you know yeah it's not going to change overnight it's definitely not no. so we just constantly need to keep going um, I am one of those people that I wish I could just fly over there and just do something. I feel so helpless crazy. over here, it's, but yeah, it's one of our, it's like, one of our, so, it's so crazy because it's like you said, it's like these things took hundreds of years to build, like one person can't take them down. Like yeah. it's going to take a long time, but it's important. And it's like, it's that constant commitment to it. It's like, we can't just like let these things be a flash in the pan and like be a social media thing. Like it mm-hmm. takes work every single day in order to like not like just combat the system at hand let alone to like bring an entire system down and build a new one like that is exactly but it's important yeah exactly and just thinking like focusing on the sport management program we're not trying to change it but more so enhance it um oh it'll be better yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) and then yeah so thinking about the world we use we have um three pillars in our strategic plan and we Mm -hmm. so how we're trying to make this change and help is by education leading change and have it like being more of an inclusive community. So Mm -hmm. we might not be able to be over there right now and, you know, um, feel like we're making more change, but like you said, coming together, 
with education and, and talking about it and figuring out ways to help is, is a start. We just need to start and, and go really from there. It's a really good start, honestly. It's a really, Perfect. really good start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I agree. Yep. It's, um, it's, it's important too, right? It's really, really important that we all do that in the, in the place, in the spaces that we're in. Like you have to demand more from the, from the places that you exist or you leave them. Like that's kind of exactly. how I see it. Like yeah. with like Mac house and like everything that we're doing, like any partner that comes on board, even if they want to pay us for things, what is your DNI strategy? Like what are you doing in the wake of what's going on in the world? Exactly. Like what are you committing to as a brand? Like we're not going to work with anybody who doesn't have, and that doesn't mean you have to have everything solved. It doesn't mean you have to solve the world's problems tomorrow. We know that's not, but you have to have, a clear strategy. You have to know what you're working towards and you have to be doing something. And exactly. if you're not, then I don't want to be involved in anything to do with that. You know, like I just don't want any part of it. And if I lose money because of it, then so be it. You know, that for me is like, we have to like put our foot down. You know, we have a lot of power as individuals of where we spend our money, you know, what we give energy to, what we, what things we speak at, what, what like panels, like it's up to me as a white person, as a white female, to ensure that whatever panel I speak on is representative of our city, is representative of, like, the culture. And if it's not, I'm not speaking on it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really important. Like, we have power as individuals in our own spaces and our own circles. Like, we have that power. And we just have to, like, really utilize it, you know? Yeah, those personal de decisions, sorry, are impactful. And they do make yeah. it impactful. It, it, it is impactful. Like, you just think, like you said, if you guys all of a sudden, like, you guys make this program, I'd say, like, I mean, Toronto is a wonderfully diverse place. And, like, that program should reflect it. You know what I mean? And so once that program starts looking a lot more like the city that we live in or the, the province that we live in, the, like, trickle-down effect of that, of, like, young women – young black people seeing people that look like them in that program who then go on to become successful sports executives, whether it be in the business space, the front office space, which then trickles down to younger people seeing the, like, it just, it has like generational effect. Like that stuff is really, really important, right? Like you guys could diversify the program and someone who is a result of that, um, like deliberate nature of making sure that people are represented goes on to become the first female president of an NHL team or the first black head coach in, of a NHL team. Like that type of, and that goes all the way back to like the school programs that they attended and their high school, you know what I mean? Like that stuff has like ripple effects across the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. I mean, looking at the demographics of women and men, yes, huge difference. But then mm -hmm. looking at ethnicities, like, it's true. It's such a, it's it's only one. You basically only see one and maybe a couple trickle around here and there. That's a problem. And it hasn't been addressed for, I don't know, how long. Um, yep. And that's, like happen. you said, when accountability comes in. So what are we going to it's do like, about it? It's like, checking the box of one diverse area is not like, you know, there's been plenty of women in sports panels that are all white women. That's not diversity. Like it's just not, that's gender diversity, but it's not actual true diversity, diversity. That's not actual true equity. It's just yeah. not, yeah. you know? And so exactly. we have to sort of like get out of our minds of like checking boxes and like really look at like what type of world do we want to live in what type of culture or organization do we want to be and that's i think where people sometimes miss the boat you know mm -hmm. like oh okay we're gonna hire a woman coach and a woman front office and a woman and then now like you said now all of a sudden like okay cool you have more women but that does, does that make you a more diverse yeah. place do you have um any people of color do you have diversity of sexual orientation of do you have um is your workplace accommodate people with disabilities like there, there's just like diversity and inclusion means a bunch of different things and if you're not really really committed to it like the half-ass efforts are, become yeah. very apparent if that makes sense yeah definitely and nothing will change yes <laughs> right. i agree <laughs> and that's 
it's not good. Like, we don't want that. That's just not what we want. Definitely yeah. not. Definitely not. So I'm, um, I'm glad that we're all in this together and we're making these changes slowly but yeah. surely. I applaud what you guys are doing. It's awesome. If I can support in any way, please let me know. Happy to, um, happy to contribute in any way. I've given, I've given the guys plenty of time and plenty of, <laughs> so I'm happy. I'm happy to support you guys and what you're doing. I think it's really great. Well, thank you. We, we truly appreciate that very much. No problem at all. Awesome. Okay. Well, we'll let you go. Thank you so much again for coming no on and sharing your wisdom and experience. You. Yeah. No, no, don't worry. It's been, uh, it's been good chatting with you guys. Please stay in touch. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I really, really think what you guys are doing is good. So keep it up. Perfect. Thank, Thank you so much. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. day. You too. Thank you. Bye.